So let's go ahead and get rocking and rolling. Uh, team tonight or today, we are going to be talking about chapter eight. Chapter eight is setting up for success with the Golem package. Um, I've added some learning objectives to this particular uh, uh, meeting uh, notice. So the first learning objective is initializing the Golem framework. Um, this is through R to generate the folder pack, uh, uh, file directory structure of Golem. And then we're gonna go through and start adding content. Uh, the second learning objective is to populate the framework with details. Uh, in this example uh, uh, slide deck, we're going to see how you would exercise the uh, dev01 uh, setup R and then the dev01, I don't remember what that name is, but we'll get to it. The third learning objective is reviewing the folder structure. So once the uh, Golem package is generated, uh, we're going to have another snippet of what that uh, package looks like in its entirety. And then finally, the last statement here is comprehend how the package here works. Um, Russ and Fabrica, if you remember the user's name, I'm sorry that I'm not giving her credit. Uh, I don't remember. I know it starts with J and her last name is B, uh, but that's the only thing I can remember. Uh, she wrote a blog post and uh, has some content on GitHub in relation to the here R package. Uh, oh, that'll, package. Be, <laughs> that'll be Jenny Bryan. That's it. Is yes, it, I knew it's it was It's a rather inflammatory um, post, isn't it? It's is something it? along it the is. lines of, if I see set working directory in your script, yep. so I'm going to set your computer on fire or something. That's exactly right. Um, yep. Yeah. So I, uh, I've only recently in the last couple of days uh, started using the here package and I'm very uh, excited to its capability. Um, I look at it as kind of like almost an automated system in the background that just manages all of my folder structure. I don't have to really think about it. And uh, opinions aside, um, I, I'm supportive of it because it takes one less thought process out of managing yeah, yeah. the development procedure or the production procedure. So, all right, moving to the next slide. So the first steps here um, that we are going to do is to actually set up the Golem uh, feature. So the first step is developer workflow. Uh, we want to, uh, first off, the project manager, uh, we spoke to that uh, task or that, that job role uh, in a previous session. The project manager is often the individual that is uh, creating this Shiny app and possibly hiring or interacting with collaborators, uh, specific subject matter experts. So the project manager is the individual that would initially create the uh, application, uh, create the file structure and, and commit that to version control. And so those are the sub bullets here. Uh, first steps to be filled, uh, general structure is set and then the project is registered to version control. We're committing it uh, to whatever version control services that uh, we are going to be working with within our organization. The second step is you are going to start immediately prototyping your UI. Well, in the past presentations that we've had on this book club, we have stated that oftentimes uh, you just get down and dirty really quick. You start to build your Shiny app and then realize I need to, to make this a more production grade uh, uh, path. You may already have a app.r, you may already have a ui.r and a server.r uh, uh, file structure within Shiny we are now going to copy and paste that pre-existing code into Golem uh, to create our more functional uh, structure of what Go Golem is ma managing. And then that would include uh, working on the CSS and JavaScript elements um, or working on any of the backend functionality. The third is to work on the integration of everything inside the reactive context. So, once the prototyping is complete, you're happy with its look and feel. Now we're going to start uh, managing the finer details of the application itself, whether we have requirement tags, whether we have um, uh, like pause points, uh, execution buttons, et cetera, radio buttons, uh, so that we're not overloading the server uh, with mass calls of, of the uh, reactive concept. Um, if you don't add those pause points within your Shiny app, immediately as soon as you change a variable, all of a sudden it incurs this heavy workload of the server to regenerate whatever is populated. Um, you want to, uh, again, this is, I believe, Frederica's section of chapters six and seven, uh, or maybe Russ, you had made the comment about it. 
we were discussing the reactive calls and then adding pause points in there. Okay. So here we're going to talk about code snippets. I didn't generate this code snippets. These are, are from the textbook uh, uh, put into this presentation slide. So I added a, a additional variable that or additional step uh, that wasn't listed uh, in the chapter. Uh, the author did not include this. So I wanted to uh, include this for a newer person or newer user uh, of the Golem package. You're going to be required to install any libraries if they're not already pre-configured or pre-installed in your R environment. Uh, examples would be Golem itself, possibly the here package. Okay. And once those are uh, compiled, once you've installed those packages and you're citing the, uh, the library uh, applications, you wanna go to uh, the file option within our studio, select new project. Now I found a trick here. Uh, and if you would like, I can bump over to R real quick and just show you what I stumbled into. Um, there's one additional step here uh, of inside this new project, you get the three options of either local file pre-existing or version control. Well, some uh, layman person or an individual that may not be familiar with what those three choices are uh, may find that as a, a hurdle. I would recommend personally at this point to do a version control, but that's also, also managed within the Golem package itself. Um, so I'm just gonna say new project, uh, uh, not the pre-existing or not get, let's just use new project and then we'll move on. Once you select new project, you're gonna have to scroll down quite a ways uh, or at least in my computer, I had to scroll down quite a ways to see the option package for Shiny app using Golem. Okay, so let's show the team what I'm referring to here. Uh, going to the RStudio service, and I'm going to run this real quick. So I have already pre-installed the packages themselves, and I've created the uh, citation or the, the, the uh, link to both the here and the Golem uh, packages. So I'm just gonna run this golem create golem and then I'm adding my path variable of home directory documents, GitHub, book club, EPGS, and then the name of the file is goal X. Well, that's already been ran. And so if I go back to my previous file structure, I've already created the goal X directory, but let's delete this real quick and show you what happens. Okay, so I didn't have anything populated in there anyway. Um, Let's run this code real quick and you will see, oh, okay. Uh, what, I guess it's probably still waiting. Mm, I don't see anything pausing. Let's refresh that and let's try running again. I may be freezing up. Well, at any rate, if you run that particular code yeah, it's not in my environment either. The, um, it'll create the Golex directory. Uh, so you, you create this whole process of uh, uh, Golem uh, generating maybe, this. Maybe because you are not in the book club uh, um, uh, uh, project. Here you are in Golex, up above here in the, on the right corner, up on the right corner. Okay. Of your, yeah, you see Golex. Uh, oh, the, that's a yeah. great comment. Yep, good, good point, Frederica. Thank you for noticing that. Um, let's refresh and go back to the original. Okay, let's try this again. So I am going to run that code snippet. There we go. Thank you, Frederica. That is exactly correct. Uh, so it's indicating that Golex, Golex already exists. Do you want to override it? I'm going to go ahead and select yes. Um, even though I've deleted it, it's still in the cache memory. So um, let's go ahead and hit save. And now, again, as, as Frederica had mentioned, it changes to the Golex uh, uh, main directory uh, using the uh, here uh, R package. I can now see that the Golex uh, application is rendered. Um, I don't want to enter another instance. Uh, let's do our, to re that. Uh, is it still open? Yeah, it's blank. Okay, never mind. 
Let's just re-knit it and get back to where we were. Sorry for the disruption. Uh, there we go. Okay. So all right. our I've, code... I've learned a new I've learned a new trick in our studio from that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, I I I didn't even notice Frederica's statement of the uh, I'm not even in the right environment. So yeah. Frederica, that's a great uh, great <laughs> notice. With the uh, uh, code snippet, we're going to generate that uh, structure, and then the I'm not scrolling up and down, am I? Oh, there's no scrolling required. Uh, you can view your new project directory uh, structure using the uh, folder, is it folder structure, is that FS? And then directory tree, and then naming the Golex uh, package that you just created or, or app that you just created, app structure that you just created. Uh, note, if you get an output with FS directory tree Golex, your package is working properly. Uh, so let's go see what that looks like. And I'm going to go back to our studio. We are in the EPGS point. So scroll down, scroll down, and hit run. OK. So on our output side, from the Golex new uh, app that we're generating, this package manager that we just generated, we're going to have that folder structure. Um, Russ, I believe, uh, or Frederica, uh, we have discussed this folder structure in a past yeah, uh, yeah. A I chapter. Yeah, I talked about it a couple of weeks ago. but. In, in a rather rushed and ill-prepared way, but yeah. <laughs> Good. So the, the different uh, folders that we witness within this environment um, is our R folder. That's where our app and UIs are going to live. The dev folder, these are going to be um, like uh, project level or, or uh, package level uh, variables that we're going to be populating. That's the next section I'll be discussing. Um, you have your... Uh, instantiation is that or instant the inst file it's, app these are um that directory are things that are moved to the top level on installation of the package. installation okay uh, yeah. uh installation app and then dub 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 we're going to talk about changing the favicon uh ico if if we do want that as an option um golem config yaml uh, we're going to discuss what the three uh, our four our, uh, calls are going to do in relation to the golem config uh, YAML file. And then finally, we have our uh, manual directory run app.rd. OK, going back to our studio, or going back to our presentation. So the fact that the FS directory golem uh, call, Golex call worked on my machine, that implied that automatically the here package is managing the directory structure um, by making that file call, uh, uh, environment call. I listed out the directory tree. Um, if you witness that as an initial stage, you know that you're heading in the right direction. If at, one, at, at any point it doesn't operate as intended, I would recommend that you go back and look, have you installed those packages? Look at your errors that you may be getting. Um, more than likely, there's going to be something of, of tangible evidence that uh, will direct you to the, to the uh, point where you may not have followed the complete steps. Okay. All right. And this one does have a long scroll. Okay. So the next step within this chapter is going to be setting things up with the dev01 start.r file. The file itself is the first file that you need to populate and run. Well, what are we populating? What content are we putting in here? This is going to be uh, usernames, uh, possibly email addresses, the description of what this app is doing, uh, kind of the intent, et cetera. So with the dev1 start file, you need to populate some pertinent information related to your project note. This is an automated system. I always enjoy when users try to, uh, individuals that are not familiar with package management, go in and start to modify a uh, automated system, and then it gets all sorts of buggery. Uh, it, it, it starts to crash and fail, and, and you have a whole bunch of scratching your heads of why. In this package management concept of, or Golem package management concept, you allow the application to populate variables. And then when you run or call on that script, it will automatically generate all your YAML calls. You don't want to go in and just directly 
manipulate your YAML, okay? So note, this is an automated system. Only edit and run this file first as the remaining steps will be completed in sequence for proper package processing. Um, I believe that's a copy and paste. Uh, the golem fill description is the function call that will uh, uh, instantiate your uh, IP uh, sum app. That's just the uh, name of the document uh, that or app that we're creating within this uh, chapter. The title of the package, currently it's just package title. Uh, package description, again, is populated with package description. These are all things that you would want to enter as your own values. Hmm. The author's first name, the author's last name, the author's email address. And then finally, <clears throat> if you have a URL uh, already established for version control, you can populate it here. Currently, it's listed as null. Um, there's another step here in a moment that we can add a get repo. Okay. So once that is filled, we are going to run the golem set golem options function. Uh, note the, uh, this adds your information to the golem, uh, golem YAML config file uh, and sets the here package root sentinel. This is important as here manages the root of your project. If you change your working directory within the project, you will still be able to create the module and CSS files because of the here package. Um, again, this is kind of that automation step concept. You don't really have to think of what you're doing. You may be in a different directory altogether, but by making that call, um, here already manages exactly where your root directory is, the description, and, it's, and, and starts to populate the rest of its needed variables. Okay. All right, next step is setting up the common files. If you like to uh, set your license, readme, code of conduct, uh, lifecycle badges, and any news uh, uh, RMD files, you can do so here. Everything that you're dealing with within this context are going to be uh, R markdown files. So uh, uh, follow your normal protocol for managing markdown content uh, using the heading levels and the ordered list, unordered list type concepts. Um, you can create all of these different uh, features. It is recommended within a project that you always have a readme file. Uh, to give a person some guidance on where uh, you're going. If you are making this a Creative Commons, uh, a GPL license or MIT license, uh, you may wanna add that in there. If you are working in a open source uh, site, uh, open source project, it is always recommended to have a code of conduct, um, whatever your uh, rules of engagement may be uh, with your collaborators. Um, Russ and Frederica, I'm not familiar with lifecycle badges. Is that a uh, uh, like a, a achievement type badge, or what? What does that imply? What is a lifecycle badge? Um, well, it just kind of flags to potential users that you know if it. it so, for example, if you look in, um, I, I've been doing a bit of research on the Arlang package today, and okay. some of the functions within there have a life cycle badge to indicate that they're um some are stable and some are experimental and things and it's a kind of just to, to oh, i see that you know things may be subject to change and what yeah you're still in a development mode it's yeah. it's it's in a uh, beta test type uh, scenario things are intended to break um, yeah. or if it's stable and, and operational everything should be rock solid i understand what that implies now okay excellent um any news that you may have in relation, a good example would be uh, like changes to the package if you were uh, evoking a versioning type system and you were going from version 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. Well, within that news might be any changes made to that package and its relation to um, how the, uh, the user would be experiencing uh, or expecting from that, uh, that change. Um, you can do so within this uh, particular common file. So to do that, uh, you're evoking a use this uh, and then use MIT license and we'll just name it golem user. Um, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this uh, use MIT license is a uh, particular variable populated content. So if you changed it to GPL 3.0 or GPL or uh, Creative Commons, are those uh, exercised variables within the golem package? Are you familiar with that or not? I'm not, uh, no, I'm not. I, I didn't, 
I didn't spend any time to go see if those are, are populated variables, but I have reason to believe that these are already pre-installed within the Golem package. So if I make a different call, it would pull in that legal language representing that type oh, of, I see of what you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, no, um, use this, <coughs> um, the package use this, uh, has a few functions for pulling in, um, you know, GPL license and MIT license and such and such. And it will, um, when you, when you run it in a package, it will add a, um, it will ha add a license.mv with, um, your name and the name of the license that's being used. It doesn't pull in, um, any legal, uh, no, Content it doesn't pull in the light. Uh, I, 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 to my to my knowledge, oh, hold on, I'll okay. just have a look at Dupree or something. Yeah. Um, um, I can so, go look at that, use this as an option and see what you can pass in there. I didn't experiment before the uh, presentation, so I'm kind of throwing out a rhetorical question. Yeah, so what happens is when you, when you run um, that, it will add a field to the description file that says okay. MIT plus file license. And what that indicates is that you're using uh, the R project's legal version of the MIT license. Okay. And there's a little bit of metadata to indicate that, say, you're the copyright holder and the copyright Good point. was initiated in 2021 or something like that. Um, Yes, is there? A... It, do, it doesn't pull in the text of the MIT license. Okay, um, and, does it? And, and, uh... That doesn't happen in any R package. Uh, gotcha. It's very rare to see the the, do the you... actual license text. But... Is there any association to uh, a URL or a link for a person to go review that license? Uh, um, does that populate? Yeah, uh, the, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure. It, Exactly. We'll just have a look in the our extensions thing again. Um, okay. uh, so, license went. Um, ba -ba -ba. So yeah, I, um, the I mean the 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 legalese for those documents is pretty well established and in fact the yes. r project has their own version i'll put it in the chat so okay. there's a url um where the r r projects version of each of those licenses can be obtained so like for example the mit license yeah. you can obtain from there yep and it will um, when you use use MIT license from use this, it will assume that you're using the text of the license as defined in the R project, but with Perfect. your year and your, you know, you yourself as the copyright holder. Exactly. Um, Good point. Nope, that's a great great statement, and I I thank you for uh, expanding into that topic. It's not something I uh, uh, tested or or tried to uh, uh, mess with prior to the presentation. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, thank you for expanding on that. Uh, we also has, uh, or we also have uh, use README RMD. Uh, currently, it's it's false. Um, use any code of conduct, lifecycle badge, or or news. Uh, again, still showing false. Uh, Russ, you had already expanded on that lifecycle tag. Thank you for explaining exactly what that meant. Um, that now makes sense inside that particular tag. As populated, it's showing experimental. Um, if you had it as stable or any other type of lifecycle uh, life cycle tag, when I run uh, this uh, uh, particular section, all of this media gets pop, or all these variables get populated into that YAML structure. And then lastly, uh, we have the use this and then the 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 uh, get option. Why this is imperative or why this is important? It goes back to the very beginning of the subject when I stated when you create a new project, you have either three options to choose from. If you automatically associate with get from the very onset of your project, does that auto populate your repo URL into this code or do you have to also enter that here as well? 
Is it like a, a double option? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'd okay. imagine not. I imagine if you've already set up the repo at the project's initiation, you probably can comment out that line of the uh, Agreed. script. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the next section is 833, using recommended elements. Um, the Golem use recommended tests and the Golem use recommended depths uh, sets a default testing infrastructure within your package or within your Golem infrastructure. Uh, it also adds dependencies to these applications. Uh, Russ, you probably have a lot more experience with these two options, uh, being the, uh, the leader, cohort leader, um, as well as, as your experience in Golem period. But uh, No, I don't really know, I'm afraid. No, no. okay, all right. Uh, no. Uh, no, I don't. I, I'm afraid I don't know so much about that. Um, I, I can. I mean, um, uh, no, I, I. I. I'm not entirely certain what they impose on a project. Well, um, earlier in in discussions, uh, earlier chapters that we covered, uh, we used the test this package. Mm. Uh, would that be a similar requirement within this context, uh, or does Golem use that as a Automated system test. I um, the well the recommended dependencies seems to pull in things like um, Shiny and Glue and HTML tools and, and Golem obviously. Um, the the the, yeah. the recommended tests um, probably will pull in Shiny test and test that and I see. Um, but I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I do, and, and also, I'm not sure whether that includes um, the, 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 does that add a kind of uh, a, a, an initial test script to the project? It may I, well do. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I can sorry, go. I don't mean to take over, but I do, genuinely no. don't know. Okay, no worries. Uh, I, I'll do a little bit more research. Maybe I'll bring I'll come back to this topic at a later point. Yeah. The um, I didn't expand into exactly what those calls are intending. Um, my initial thought was the uh, test this package. Uh, if that is a um, what do you call that an underlying support package to Golem? Uh, yeah. If that just automatically gets pulled into that section, or is this additional tests that you as a developer are imposing on the uh, contributors and or users of the, the package itself. Mm. So I, I go back to the very beginning, Russ and Frederica, I'm sorry for expanding into the subject, yeah, but cool. cool. I go back to our, our introduction uh, uh, first time when we were discussing all of this and you were indicating the linter package, lint R package, and that uh, it won't even pass its own intended tests type concept. concept. I think I'm not wanting, now, but... <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'm not wanting to uh, uh, make it into a, into a debate. It's, it's the management of this engineering grade production level package. If we impose these additional services, um, is that recommending to the future user of the app or is that as the uh, 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 production level, uh, engineering level uh, that is contributing to the package before release to public? Either way. Um, the next is utility functions. And I found this one uh, important. Uh, this is where we talk about the copying and pasting. So the next two code snippets or steps will add various functions which can be used along the process of building your app. The examples from the textbook are Golem use utilities UI and then Golem use utilities server. Uh, I believe I have thoughts towards exactly what those two in, uh, implications mean um, because Golem is a package manager. If you have any um, odd behavior within your syntax of, of your app or, or UI uh, server uh, calls, it would automatically flag those. Um, I don't know that for a fact, um, but I'm only implying that that would intend to be what it does. Because these are support utilities, uh, the examples that they provide in the text is list to li, um, a function that takes a R markdown list and then creates it into an HTML list. 
another example would be the uh, with Red Star. And if you are developing an app that would require some mandatory input uh, before a server call, you know, non-reactive uh, uh, execution, we need to ensure that this populated variable in this cell block is entered prior to uh, submitting uh, data back to the server. So the with red star is kind of like a requirement or a, a validation point within that entry, um, puts a red asterisk next to the mandatory input. Okay. All right. Yeah. In uh, chapter 835, so excuse me, section 835, this is discussing uh, potentially changing the favicon. Uh, by default, Golem uses the uh, Golem hex uh, R sticker or the favicon. Um, if you as a, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? You always want to uh, brand your production application, shiny application. And so you may have your own user interface. Maybe it's a, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? I always mess this word up. I apologize. It is your style guide. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. If your company, uh, your project uh, has a style guide application of where things sit, what color codes to use, uh, possibly the icons themselves, um, the favicon would be a reference to that particular ICO file. Okay. Hmm. Lastly, once complete, I don't know why my tab is open. There we go. Uh, once complete, you can move to the second step, and that's going to be the dev02 dev r uh, option. So we're going to move to the to the next section here. Next slide. So now, if we followed that particular workflow at the beginning of our, our chapter, we're at that third stage. At this point, we're setting up the infrastructure for prototyping. We're actually building the app populating the Golem package. We're now at that uh, stage where we want to test out if the function is working. So at this point is where you're generating your, your various modules. Uh, at an earlier chapter of this textbook uh, or document we were discussing, uh, we always want to make functions as small and maintainable as possible. Instead of having these big monolithic blocks of code, you want to try to break them down into their own uh, subsetting. By doing that, it makes the uh, collaboration and maintain maintenance uh, simpler, easier. So the Golem add module uh, call is a function that creates a module in the R folder. Uh, by default, it is uh, prefixed with mod underscore, and you can also create the mod asterisk UI. I think the asterisk is what you want to call it. I'm pretty sure. I think that's a wild card. Uh, as defined in this uh, paragraph, and then the mod server, mod asterisk server. Uh, this is both for the UI and the server functions. Uh, do you want to expand on that topic, Russ? I know the small calls are usually near and dear to your heart. <laughs> or not, I, it's okay. Uh, I'm... I'm... Um, I... Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, sorry, I'm, I'm having a look through the, the dev o2 o2 dev file uh okay. at the moment yeah um so um add module so this would add um yeah i don't know i mean i, I quite like that there's a function that will build um uh because it's so i mean i know it's only like a like, like a niggling little problem but like when there's a a dash rather than an underscore and, and whatnot in a file name and every other file of the same type has a underscore it, it can be quite uh just a, a minor annoyance and um yeah Searching it's quite nice it. that there's a function that 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 sets these things up that that will populate the skeleton for the um, structure of a new module and whatnot um yeah um, uh here you can uh, you'll paste all of the uh, files from the app UI. Uh, if you have them as one single file, you just separate your UI and your app sections. Or if you started out with a uh, two file structure, the UI and the and the server R packages, you would take the text that you had uh, initially populated there and then paste that into this new generated mod file. By doing so, it's allowing the Golem 
auto structure or automated structure to manage those additional modules. Okay. This is the core of your application and where the development focus uh, begins and, and mainly is concentrated. Um, so let me just pause for a brief moment and discuss that last sentence. Um, I added that uh, into the uh, text. What I wanted to reinforce within the author's uh, chapter statement, most of your development time or most of your committed creation time is going to be within this add module type section. And the idea or plan is that this is really where the, the majority of the work is completed as Golem is, is managing the overall package as a whole. We talked earlier about the readme file, the licensing, the lifecycle badge, et cetera. That's initial type, quick touch points. Maybe it, it takes you a very short time to generate all of that media. As I am testing or, or developing the production application, here is the focal point of where majority of your time would be spent. If you were a project manager and you were allotting uh, a labor time frame to each of these various steps, I would put 50 to 60% of your time within this one step. Uh, that's bug testing, uh, uh, being able to modify code, et cetera. Um, this one section is where most of your, of your production happens. Any comments or thoughts to that statement? Um. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, um, it's th th certainly uh, certainly at the early stages of building an app. I I I totally agree. I think towards when you know bugs are in, uh, uh, making themselves apparent, known, um, <laughs> um, uh, things of that nature. I think there's probably a bit more a bit more work is done in the debugger and writing tests and things like that to, to, to clarify things. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'd agree that when you're kind of, when you're initially building an app, you will spend a lot of time kind of adding, working in this place, you know, kind of adding new code and adding new um, JavaScript files and whatnot. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is where my, my presentation ends. I didn't get a chance yeah, to finish yeah, cool. the paragraph 842. Uh, so I'm gonna jump over to the text, textbook if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's do, let's grab this and we'll bring that over here and then we'll show the uh, last section here. So the, oh, my numbering sequence isn't right. Uh, anybody that's reviewing this video, uh, I apologize for an error in uh, the numbering. I'll try to correct that uh, when I post to the uh, repository. But uh, we're dealing with paragraph 832, um, adding CSS and Java files. Um, when you are adding your various uh, initial touchpoint, readme files, licensing, et cetera, then we uh, focused on the second section where we're creating all of our modules, addition, uh, uh, test sequences, et cetera. Here in this last uh, uh, touch point is going to be any support material to that. If you have your own style guide, a CSS file, uh, you can apply it here. If there is additional JavaScript that you may have, I don't know, database calls uh, or uh, uh, maybe uh, what are uh, some other additional uh, mathematics maybe that you've got applied within your script, um, you can add those JavaScript uh, libraries uh, within this point. So the call that we're making is golem add JS file and then pointing it at the name of the file itself. Uh, it's currently populated with script at any rate. Um, you would want to add whatever that uh, purpose would be. This is going to generate the following line within that uh, call and that's document.ready function. And then there you have it. It's just a little blurb within your context that populates from that file. Here you'll have the infrastructure for launching JavaScript, JavaScript code. Uh, so you can add a JS handler um, if that's an option as well. Uh, we can see as an example in that function call, we've got shiny.addCustomer message handler. And then we're passing the variable fun with functional, functional argument uh, as the populated text. 
The final statement in chapter eight is where we are discussing the CSS file, um, going back to the statement I made about potentially branding, potentially color codes, uh, favicons, that don't, don't get confused with the favicon comment. Um, if you have your uh, bootstrap library, maybe is a possibility. So your own featured CSS, the look and feel of the page, yeah. you could add that custom path by using the uh, uh, service golem add CSS file and then that named CSS that you created. Okay. Frederica, I know you had just finished your Tidy Tuesday entry. Uh, uh, I was reviewing it. I thought that looked very professional. Um, do you have your own CSS that you apply to create your page layout? Or is that something that you, you create on your own? That's a good statement. Uh, so, <laughs> it, um, still I'm customizing my graph um, each time. I see. Okay. Not, and uh, um, just just some uh, like if I the, the last time I did a function for making a a, a, um, a combo plot, so mm -hmm. I've been able to do two plots in one just in one call basically. I see. But uh, yeah, it would. Um, I have uh, taken inspiration from some others. Um, Tidy Tuesday. Uh, uh, makers, uh, yeah, uh, they 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 had a very good uh, like team for for making plots and everything. So I've taken some inspiration, but then each time is different. So if you don't yeah. want to copy, you need to to do it from scratch again. I don't know. I I, I like to have a standard to be honest. Agreed. Um, but, uh, In our yeah. In our uh, uh, chapter that I presented a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Think R group, uh, we were discussing a uh, particular uh, example, Shiny app, and it was it was dedicated to a Tidy Tuesday uh, event. I think it was in 2019, but they had an entire page with all of their uh, graphical uh, graph. Uh, uh, by the way, I learned a new term. If you haven't uh, watched a couple of week, a couple of days ago, uh, Grobs. Uh, Grobs is graphical objects. Um, I've never heard that term used before. It was in the GG plot book. But uh, anyway, graphical objects that think our team using Golem, using package management, using the uh, production grade level document that they're authoring here, they developed that Tidy Tuesday application. And it's very professional looking. Uh, I would presume if we went to that GitHub repo, there would probably be a CSS file that they're calling on and then all the context inside it. So it's kind of like an auto look and feel. So, okay. uh, still have um, to understand how this CSS works. And, and, but uh, Golem is good because it gives you a structure. So you have um, basically everything uh, organized. This is yes. good. Uh, it's not so ad hoc. Uh, by using Golem, you are evoking some uh, controls around the production level so that it standardizes everybody else following a, a similar workflow. The, uh, the ad hoc comment I was referring to is, um, Russ, if you don't mind me picking on, on your username for a second. So let's just say Russ wants to create a, a particular shiny app. Um, it now becomes uh, uh, very reliant. Everybody uses it, maybe a COVID-19 tracker or something to that context. And now it is uh, out in the wild. Now I've got to try and manage it. The word ad hoc, the vocabulary term I'm using here is something that isn't normal. Uh, it's very grassroots developed, um, kind of a, a one-off production, or sorry, one-off app um, that now you have to try and wrangle back into a mm -hmm. production level type detail. Um, Russ, I think you made that statement uh, earlier in, in previous yeah, exchanges, yeah. sir. Oh, I mean, the, the, one of the issues is that the, the, there are a lot of firms in the world now making shiny apps who each have their own uh, view of what a, um, a production grade app should look like. So yeah. um, 
yeah, I mean, the, uh, embodied in this book is how Thinkar uh, produce their apps, but the, there'll be a lot of firms who aren't using Gollum or are using, you know, alternative. And yeah, if you end up being the maintenance programmer on them, it can be quite interesting because everything's slightly different from everything else. So what I really like about this Gollum thing is that, you know, there's more consistency from one app to an, to the next. Do you, uh, do you mind if I, I just pause for a brief moment? I'm going to oh, yeah, mute yeah, my course, mic yeah. and camera phone. I got to go answer the front door real quick. Yeah, uh, yeah, just yeah. give me yeah, two seconds. Yeah. I'll be right back. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, Federica, the, there's a couple of, the, a couple of sections towards the end of this book that are on uh that there's like um an introduction to css at the end um and within that there's a few um external resources which might be quite useful if, if you are looking to um uh learn a bit more about that um certainly i found the mozilla um things can i share something oh, Which no, I one? Share. uh there's something it's um in the book it's referred to as learn to style html using css which is a kind of a tutorial that the mozilla network put together on styling css but yeah it, in chapter 18 of the book there's a few links to things on uh css and and whatnot and and similarly the previous the chapter prior to that on JavaScript has a few external resources as well. Um, anyway, sorry, back to you, Ryan. <laughs> I, uh, what I find I very you. ironic, there we go. What I find by, very ironic is the uh, title of that chapter 18 that says a gentle introduction. <laughs> uh, <laughs> both JavaScript and CSS is very large. The uh, the when I say large, I mean it's very spread out. There are so many different uh, JavaScript libraries that you can access. Um, each large software firm kind of has their own way that they manage JavaScript libraries. Um, if you look at CSS, there is a huge quantity of different uh, uh, syntactical styles within the CSS language. Uh, so if uh, um, to not make you confused, Frederica, if you talk about um, uh, SAS, if you've heard that term before, uh, S-A-S-S, um, or there's a C-S-C-S-S, mm. and I don't know how to pronounce that yeah. one, but uh, these different types or, or different, I don't even know what you want to call it. It's not versions, uh, 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 paradigms, but we'll use the word paradigm. Uh, these different uh, paradigms of CSS file structure even have their own methods of writing code as well. So I'm, I'm only I, uh, uh, showing irony to the word gentle introduction. Um, it's a very big topic. It, it, there's a lot that goes into this. So yeah, uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to move into chapter nine. Uh, again, team, I want to apologize to the group. I did not have a, a, a moment of time to develop a no, uh, worry, presentation worry. for this section. I will finish the, the uh, presentation media and then we'll upload that to our, our repo. Uh, for the time being though, I'm just going to use the uh, textbook as, as the presentation media. Okay. So section nine is talking about building the uh, IP sum app. The idea behind this isn't really creating anything. It's really just talking about, I, I almost consider this like a, it's okay. I'll, I'll pause for just a moment. Russ had to uh, exit as well. So the, this uh, is... Uh... This is the 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 the, other, the second chapter for for this week, and but they they don't do an example, is it? I no. Uh, so what what I was what I was referring to is they don't 
give us any sort of uh, uh, text, I guess, to create it. Um, we have some calls here, uh, but it's okay. not really anything of, of really uh, strong development importance. And I'm not discrediting it at all. Uh, I'm only commenting that mm -hmm. I find that chapter nine is almost like a reinforcing point of the uh, uh, workflow, chapter five, and then even the chapter six, UX matters. There's a lot of text or a lot of reinforcing text to minima minimize everything, keep it as, as small and, and short and sweet as possible. So the, the initial entry of this chapter is just talking about the prototyping and the uh, making things as simple as possible and easy as possible. So there's a uh, quote here uh, that says, prototyping first may help keep you from investing far too much time for marginal gains. Being able to present a media type, uh, uh, this shiny app, being able to prototype it at least gets the concept out the door. After you have the app up and running, now we can start to polish things, but you're kind of uh, wanting to get the core concepts of, of what this app is doing, right? You've, you've already po possibly uh, uh, whiteboarded or uh, uh, what's that word called when you're when you're uh, just getting out a notepad and drawing it out. Uh, it's uh, storyboarding, storyboarding. Mm -hmm. So you've already uh, possibly drawn a UML diagram. You've probably storyboarded kind of the path of flow uh, for your end user. As I now create a electronic media or a package that is going to replicate my initial design, the prototyping concept is uh, at least getting it out there first. There's a second uh, rule here, and that's the art of Unix programming. Um, rule of optimization, prototyping before polishing. Uh, get it working before you optimize it. You have to have at least something that works. If you spend infinite amounts of time, uh, uh, I always treat myself as squirreling uh, really fast. I'll see some, I don't know, new service, new shiny tool, and I'm not using shiny as, as the term shiny apps, but uh, a new polished service that I want to evoke in my app. And then I go off down a rabbit hole trying to uh, uh, incorporate it. It may not add value at all. Uh, so you want to keep things simple initially in prototyping, then you can figure out how to optimize it at a later point. Um, that is part of that art of Unix programming. Making things work before working on a lower level optimization makes the whole engineering process easier. One of the really nice things about running your program frequently is that you get to see it in a running fashion. Um, the, I love this example, uh, the figure that they have here. So how not to build a, a minimum variable pro uh, a viable product. You don't wanna start with the circle and then add a line between the circles and then add a, uh, a uh, container around it. And then finally we get a car at the end. You want to start out with uh, a association of what the intent is. If this is a vehicle, that's just an object that we're, we're uh, comparing to our uh, uh, metaphor, comparing our, our app to, we know it's some form of transportation and it's going to have some level of wheels to it. So the first uh, version is just a skateboard. I need to get from point A to uh, point B in the most efficient way possible. Then you may upgrade or graduate to a scooter uh, maybe option three is a bicycle where you're going a little bit faster. Uh, by option four, you're, you're riding a motorcycle. Uh, now you can uh, optimize your time uh, between uh, points A and B. And then finally, uh, the safest mode of operation is, is that vehicle option number five, where you're completely contained within your own environment, uh, four wheels and can get from point A to point B, or maybe even a longer distance, if that's the case. Right? So it's just the, the differences here of uh, uh, metaphorically explaining the development or prototyping feature. Okay. Um, extraction, uh, abstraction is hard and it makes the code base harder to work with. Um, the comment here uh, from Mr. Henry and Mr. Wickham uh, or even the, the Wickham and uh, I'm going to mispronounce this last name. Uh, I'm gonna say Grolmund is the service of the using the tidy text environment or the tidy universe 
uh, type of syntactical management within your Shiny app is going to only aid in the application itself. In an earlier chapter, we talked about choosing your code base uh, and then whatever you choose, just stick with it. Um, I'm also adding or, or comparing it to uh, the earlier comment I made in this presentation, uh, where if, if you start to have obscure ad hoc code within your, your uh, base, it's going to be more difficult for an engineer to comprehend what you were thinking at that moment in time. If you stay within the uh, normal software development life cycle and everyone else is familiar with the path of that life cycle, it makes the development process easier. Okay. Mm. Do you want to add a statement to that comment? It's it's very opinionated, so I don't want to uh, <laughs> deter anybody. No, no, it's fine. I think I've I think I've spoke along those lines in, uh, in previous weeks about how um, you know your kind of side projects are all fine, and you can play with whatever interesting new uh, tools there are. But in um, stuff that you have to work on with other people, it's much nicer. That you the moment work. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the moment you go to, to collaborating with others and 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 I always find this in my own personal career or, or affairs is I'll find somebody that is far more intelligent than I am <laughs> and then uh, uh, they will begin critiquing your code. Um, I always find value in that, but others may not. Uh, they may find it as almost a, a kind of an attack on their their uh, skills. Um, I'm always open for critique, both good and bad. So um, I'm not able to finish this section. Oh, us. I, we are I at know the it's top of the hour. Well, uh, okay? So ne next week is, uh, is booked in to be uh, chapter 10, which is on okay. um, building an app with Gollum. And okay. um, if it's okay, I'm, I, I might present that because I've, I've got the week off work next week, so I'll be able to put some stuff together. Um, but then again, I thought I'd have a bit more. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'll 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 talk about the second half of chapter nine as well within that. If I, because um, I, I think it's quite a nice chapter, the the chapter nine one on, uh, you know, the 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 workflow that they use for um, yes. building prototypes. If that's cool. Yes. But yes, uh, thanks for putting the uh, notes together on chapter eight and 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 doing the yes, presentation sir. today. Um, yeah, that was great. Did, um, Russ, in the past presentations, I believe I have them saved. I don't know if I've ever contributed to the project. So I may uh, enter a pull request and incorporate those in. I, I know I've got the content, uh, but I think it's in my local repo or my fork repo. Um, I don't okay. know if I've actually made the uh, the commit change. I think that was like chapters five and six maybe, or maybe you just added, chapter five. You did add chapter two and three. Um, yeah, that was the very initial, but I don't. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere yeah, in the no, I don't here. have. There doesn't appear to be anything else. But I, um, I thought I thought I'd done chapter four and five, and I know that I definitely Maybe didn't push the um, the okay. content uh, yet. Um, I I will do, but uh, yeah, sorry, it's been um, a hectic time. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, don't worry. I mean, uh, whenever you can get the notes up, that that, that that's great. And I'll um, okay. try my hardest to to merge things when they're um, ready to go. Um, awesome. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks both for All right. coming along today. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frederica. Thank you, Russ. I appreciate your time. Oh, no, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right. I'll head off um, and I'll see you next week. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Talk to you soon.